This is Home Value Stories. I'm Jamie Owen. This is a podcast that is designed to educate you, the consumer, on real estate-related topics that will help you to make a more informed decision about things related to real estate. I'm an independent residential real estate appraiser. On a regular basis, I perform real estate appraisals for probate. Have you heard of probate? How does it work? In this episode, I visit with an attorney who provides valuable information on the probate process. I hope you enjoy this one. Are you going through the probate process now? Or do you anticipate that you will in the future? There are a lot of things to think about. It's usually a difficult time because of the emotion involved in losing a loved one and at the same time trying to figure out what to do with their belongings. In this episode, I visit with attorney Jacqueline Roberts to talk about the probate process. What is probate? What should you expect if you're going through probate? How long does it take to go through? What are the alternatives to the probate process and which is less expensive? Are there things that can make the probate process go more smoothly? Attorney Roberts answers these questions and more in this episode. I hope you find this interview to be informative and helpful. Joining me today via Zoom is attorney and counselor at law, Jacqueline Roberts. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Glad to have you here. Well, how are things in the legal world these days? It depends on what field you're in. For some people, business came to a grinding halt um, with the lockdowns and and things changing. Uh, For me, it was the other way around. I think, especially if you are in estate planning, this is a busy time because COVID-19 has really sunk a lot of people into, if they wanted to avoid estate planning, now is not the time for that. So I think for a lot of people that maybe were putting it off now because of the current pandemic that really pushed things and, and into high gear. So actually I've been really busy, but, um, even with uh, the litigation side of my practice too. You would think with the economy being what it is, maybe fewer people would be suing. And it seems like it's just the opposite. More people are running the court now. <laughs> Which that is interesting. I, I've had friends tell me that in 08, it was the other way. People couldn't afford to sue. You would think, yeah. And that, I, I have to agree, 08, 09, um, like probate litigation, trust litigation went it just dried up because they figured I'd rather just take whatever I'm supposed to get from this inheritance, <laughs> take the money <laughs> and run rather than hire an attorney and possibly lose. Very interesting, the, the different dynamics in, in different time periods. Mm-hmm. Well, in addition to just being very busy, has the, pan, has the pandemic impacted your work in any other way as far as the way you do business? Definitely. Um, it used to be that we were always in the office or in court and we might have multiple meetings, um, you know, hearings, of course, we're always in person, almost always. Every now and then you'd be fortunate and get a, a judge who wanted a telephonic hearing, um, usually for like a case management conference or something. Not something really where you'd be maybe working out a settlement or something with weight to it. But nowadays, everything is Zoom or by phone. And, and then when you do have to be in the same room, like I have, um, I have a will execution. And of course, with wills, you have to have two witnesses. So if you have husband and wife or the clients, and then you have you and your witness, you better have a room big enough for social distancing. Uh, I even had one time, um, the attorney who was supposed to be my second witness forgot his mask. So he stood in the doorway 
because Ohio allows you, as long as you can see the signature, you don't have to be in the same room. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a valid, you know, signature for, for will purposes. So yeah, definitely strange times we're living in. Yes, indeed. Hopefully we'll get over this as soon, but it looks like we have a little ways to go still. Agreed. Well, what type of law do you practice and, and how long have you been doing so? So I am what we call a civil attorney. I don't really do anything in the realm of um, um, criminal law, for example. And my practice, I'm not a specialist, but my practice is focused primarily on wills, trusts, and estates, real property, and then the corporate end of things, whether it's a small business or um, nonprofits, and, and then the litigation that goes with all those different areas of law. I also handle some personal injury. That also is going up too. <laughs> uh, for a while there with the lockdown, nobody was really driving. People weren't going out and getting drunk at bars and then driving and getting into accidents. So, um, you know, for a little, there was a little bit of time there where it didn't seem like we were getting many of those cases. And all of a sudden, everybody's out and about again, I guess. And so the accidents are rising. But, um, but anyway, to answer your other question, I have been practicing law for about 18 years now. I actually started in law school. I was an intern at the Summit County Probate Court. So I started writing judicial opinions back then. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of had a backwards. Um, I think most attorneys start off with, you know, say practicing in probate and maybe working their way into the courts. And I kind of did the opposite. I was already working in the courts and worked my way out of it into private practice. So um, in any case, it's been fun. <laughs> Probably gave you an interesting perspective as you're moving through. Definitely. That is neat. I'm sure you've seen a lot of different things over the years uh, as far as that goes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know that I do some appraisal work for, for probate purposes, and, among other things. And mm -hmm. so I thought it'd be beneficial to talk to you a little bit about probate and how that all works and you know what people can expect. It's, it's such a, a tough time. But it it's good to go into it knowing what to expect. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, I've noticed, too, when I first became an attorney back in the early 2000s, a lot of clients would come to me saying, I need to trust. I need to trust. I don't want to go through probate. I, you know, it's like the worst thing in the world. And for some reason, in the last year or two, I have all these people calling me saying they want a will because they want to avoid probate. And I don't know if maybe there's some sort of finance guru out there saying that wills avoid probate. It's just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think it's, it is a really good topic to discuss because I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there right now about probate, what it's like, and it's really not as evil um, as we might think, but I, I do have to agree. I think I'd rather avoid it if I can. So, so what is probate anyway? How, how does it work? What's the process like? So yeah, it, it's definitely a process. Um, probate is that court supervised process where you're trying to administer assets for someone who has passed away and can't do it for themselves. And you're also winding up their affairs. So for example, someone may have been, um, may have owned a house and was in the middle of selling that house, but they passed away. Well, the estate has to come forward then and finish the process for them. You know, that's one example. Um, there are different types of probate, and it depends on a lot of different things. It, it could be the the type of estate, you know, whatever, what types of assets are in that probate estate, or who the beneficiary is, or the size of the estate, the composition of its assets, the, the, the amount in the estate. All of those can drive the type of probate that you have. But the basic probate, well, let's start with that. The basic probate procedure starts with an application process, a lot of forms that you're filling out at the beginning, and you have to make sure you're filing the right forms um, and the right documents that go with the forms. And it's not it's not cut and dry. Um, you know, we the, each estate is different. And so it's hard to say that we well, need form this, this and this. You know, okay, so we need 4.0, we need 1.0, 2.0 for almost every estate that we're opening, okay? But there may be other things we have to um, file at the same time. For example, right now I'm trying to probate a lost will 
We have a beautiful copy of it, but the will was lost in a move, apparently by the decedent. So we have to go through a different process, including a hearing. So um, anyway, you, you start with that application process. And once the will is accepted for probate, and the fiduciary is approved and appointed, then the court will issue letters of authority. Those are kind of your calling card. When you have that letter of authority, that tells third parties, whether it's a bank, an insurance agent, somebody interested in buying a house from the the estate, whatever. It lets them know that that person has the authority to enter into that transaction and make it happen. Um, And there are a lot of different duties then for that fiduciary besides selling property. They have to collect the assets. They have to value them, which is where you come in often. That appraisal process is key because we need the right figures. Uh, A lot of things can can happen and go wrong, whether it's with the sale or with the certificate of transfer, I mean, the um, transfer to the beneficiaries. And you might have a beneficiary who feels like, oh, this is this property is worth way more. You're not working hard enough to get the right price. There are a lot of different things that can happen with that value, whether it's personal property or real property. And also, um, you might have to face creditor claims. And you do have the right as a fiduciary to refuse to pay claims. So if there isn't enough um, if there aren't enough assets in the estate, that fiduciary is going to have to make some tough decisions and who gets paid, how much, that kind of thing. So there can be quite a bit of work involved for that fiduciary during this process. Now, within three months of appointment, our statutes say you have to file a, an inventory. Mm-hmm. So it's basically a summary of what's in the estate and then an itemized listing of what each main asset is and the approximate value of it. Um, So we are, when you go through that um, process of submitting the inventory and getting it approved by the court, that puts you in a better position for making distributions or for selling those assets. Uh, Sometimes you have a fiduciary that jumps the gun, they got that letter of authority and they're, they're just running off with it. But it can backfire in case something goes wrong with that inventory and you don't get it approved or those amounts aren't approved or somebody objects. I mean, a number of things can happen. So I advise my clients to wait until that inventory, we're done with it. (laughs) It's it's a cleaner way to do it. Um, And then within six months of appointment, the fiduciary is supposed to, hopefully they've already gotten rid of everything. They've disposed of everything in the estate, whether by selling it or distributing it to the beneficiaries. And then they're supposed to put together an account. And if it's a final account, then they can be discharged from further service and it closes the estate. But six months, it's not always realistic. Um, When things go right, six months is very doable. On the other hand, though, we do have some delays with the the courts right now due to COVID-19. Sometimes we're waiting for a um, an affidavit to be filed with the recorder's office for real property because there is a deceased surviving spouse and nothing was done to get the title out of that deceased spouse's name. Now you have the surviving spouse who's passed away and we have to probate that surviving spouse's estate. So sometimes we're waiting for that affidavit to come in before we can process that real property. So there are a lot of different things that can go wrong, (laughs) a lot of different reasons why you'd want to wait, you know, beyond the six months, but six months is a nice, um, is a nice period of time. If you can, if your estate can swing it to close out the estate, because after that, it's easier to turn down claims um, if creditors come along. So you don't want to ever close it before six months. Even if you get things done in four months, for example, don't close the estate within, unless you've gone past that six months from the date of death. So that if creditors do come along, you know, you don't have to reopen the estate then. So it saves you a little bit of money. Absolutely. Sage advice. So mm-hmm. if, if you did have to reopen, what happens in so that like situation? If you, were to, if you had closed an estate early, like say four months, mm-hmm. and then a creditor came along in month five, well, you, you most likely have to reopen the estate to deal with that. 
because then who, who would have authority to deny the claim if the estate was closed and it's an estate matter? You know, that, that's a for instance. Makes sense. Um, and then also, too, you know, I, I did mention that there are different types of probate. So there are what we call short form or abbreviated probates. Those are, and they're by statute. It's not like we're cutting corners or anything, but by statute, sometimes, um, for example, if the estate is of a certain dollar amount, then you don't have to go through the full process. You go through the abbreviated probate, or maybe it's a surviving spouse and they're just taking um, the real property and a couple of cars or something. You can really simplify probates depending on the situation that you're dealing with at the time. But um, with, with all probates, you know, you still have to wait for that judge. You need that, that approval to move on. And so I often try to steer clients away from probate just because of all the different hiccups that could come along that you can't really predict where at the time that you're drafting a will, I mean, it may be decades before that will sees the light of day and needs to be probated. And in the meantime, a lot of things can change and happen. Whereas when clients set up trusts instead, they take it out of the realm of probate and they have more control over things and more flexibility over time. So, um, so again, I don't think probate's an evil thing, but it can be problematic at times. And also too, you may have a simple estate that could, we could just do a really quick, or we should be able to do a really quick abbreviated probate, but you have this third party who's gonna give you a hard time because you don't have a letter of authority and they don't understand the decree that the judge gave. And again, like I just mentioned, it all hinges on what the court gives you. You're kind of stuck with, with that. So you have a difficult third party. There are some cases where we could have gotten by with maybe one of the shorter probates, but we went ahead and did the full probate so we'd have that letter of authority and make it easier to deal with, you know, say a, a stockbroker firm or something like that. That makes sense. So each case is a little different. It just depends on each person's uh, scenario. Yeah, exactly. No, with the uh, dollar figure, usually the the price of a trust, of creating a trust, it, people are like, oh my goodness, that's terrible. I can't afford that. It's 10 times more than a will, you know. <laughs> usually that's way cheaper or that ends up being cheaper than doing probate. So like, let that be your guide. If, if a trust attorney you know, goes through, interviews you and goes over your estate and quotes you, you know, X number of dollars, they're probably still factoring in that you're still saving what you would have to pay in pro or what the estate would have to pay in probate. That is great to know. Mm -hmm. A lot to consider there. How much does probate cost typically? So that's a tough question because um, most attorneys in this area charge a percentage, you know, there's like a, a schedule percentage, if you will. And so it's usually based on the dollar value of the estate. Sometimes that's not reasonable though. Um, I'm dealing with an estate that has quite a bit in assets, but there's very little for the attorney to do in terms of um, trying to dispose or distribute these assets. And so it's an, over a million dollars and I could take a huge percentage or I could take a percentage and it would be a huge fee, but I don't feel right about it. So, you know, we're working out an alternative. And then with those abbreviated probates, I mentioned, again, it's not that much work. So it's hard to justify. And usually I do an hourly rate in that case. So it's, it's hard to put a dollar figure because every estate's different, you know, do you have any tips that you could offer uh, that might make probate a little easier if someone chooses to go down that road? Absolutely. Um, so one thing, I think the single biggest thing, whether you are you know, planning for your estate, your demise, or you are going to be a fiduciary, is be as organized as possible. Um, make sure that your documents are easily accessible and that the, your prospective fiduciary knows generally what it should be in your estate, what your wishes are, et cetera. They're, um, the record keeping and the, the accounting, the, the tax work, et cetera, involved in an estate, whether it's a trust, or trust estate or a probate estate, it, is, it can be daunting at times. 
And so I've had some people bring me like a shopping bag full of old papers and I have to sift through it. Well, guess what? The, the attorney is charging <laughs> for that time. Yeah, Maybe rightly so. <laughs> time I had to charge hourly <laughs> <laughs> instead of a percentage. But um, in any event, you, you want that, you want to have your records organized and easily accessible and you want your fiduciary to be well acquainted with your estate and your wishes. And the probate courts are going to make you account for every little item. I mean, I don't mean like, you know, this teaspoon and, but yeah. household furnishings, for example, are likely to appear on the uh, probate inventory and, um, and uh, accounting uh, collectibles. Guns, guns are a whole, whole different bottle of wax. They're really <laughs> fun to probate. <laughs> Coin collections. Um, you might have something in your estate that it might be something that's kind of difficult to probate. And by difficult, I don't really mean that we're going to have a hard time in the court or something, just extra work involved. So that can be um, a challenge and that might be something to consider if you've got a lot of different things like that. I did have a, a gentleman who created a, a trust because he had so many collections. I mean, he collected everything. He even had a sculpture made out of popsicle sticks. Wow. Yeah. I mean, how do you value that? His trust um, agreement rather um, dispensed with the need for an appraisal. As long as the family was happy with agreeing on the amount, and they were. It was a big family too. It was kind of surprising. Everybody was on board and it went smoothly. No big Beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you are very organized and you try to um, try to simplify as much as you can, when you can, that helps as well. Um, also, I tell a lot of my clients that if you have this ring that you never wear anymore and you have it earmarked for your only granddaughter, why wait? Give it to her now. You know, you have the joy of seeing her enjoy it. So, you know, just as for instance, a lot of my clients, to them, that is a novel idea and they love it. <laughs> but for whatever reason, most people don't think of it. So that can also be very helpful in getting things out of your estate ahead of time. It won't even be part of the probate process then. Wow, that, that's a win-win right there. Exactly. Uh, oh, and yeah. one more thing too. Yeah. I, I haven't even mentioned anything about... Um, non-probate transfers. So let's say a payable on death designation on a bank account or a transfer on death on real property or your vehicle. You know, there are different ways that you could pass an asset directly to a beneficiary and then it bypasses probate altogether. Now the caveat though, is that you might have a situation where you end up with something that isn't as fair as you had originally intended for example, maybe your um, your account of fidelity is worth fifty thousand dollars, and your vehicle is worth fifty thousand dollars, and your condo is worth fifty thousand dollars. At the time that you put those PODs and TODs, and maybe you had three kids, and you gave one asset to each of them. Well, you know, values change, and it's probably not going to be equal at the time of death. Maybe you don't even have that car anymore. You know, you get the idea that yeah. things can really change. You can still put each child one third, one third, one third on the accounts, one third, one third, one third on a vehicle and on the house. But with the vehicle and the house, who really wants to own one third of something? <laughs> it's, it, and unless they agree on how to sell it or dispose of it, you can have real problems over that. So it's not. It's not a foolproof plan, but it is a way to bypass probate and it doesn't cost you anything. That makes a lot of sense. What great advice. We sure appreciate you sharing uh, all of those wonderful tips with us today. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Let's take a little break and talk about our sponsor. Home Value Stories is sponsored by FindMyAppraiser.com. FindMyAppraiser.com is a network of trusted, knowledgeable local appraisers dedicated to delivering accurate, quality valuations for your home or business. If you're looking for an excellent appraiser in your area, go to findmyappraiser.com. They have the best appraisers, appraisers that care about you, the consumer.
Uh, what areas do you cover geographically? Uh, Northeast Ohio, or how does that work in? in, in so I've actually had, um, as far as litigation and trust work, I've actually been all over the state. So an Ohio attorney can practice anywhere in state courts in Ohio. I'm also licensed to practice in the state of New York. And then in the federal court system, I'm licensed in a number of courts as well, including the United States Supreme Court, but I've ne never had the pleasure of, uh, of arguing before them, so before the Supremes. <laughs> you never know. Right. <laughs> we can hope. <laughs> Well, very good. Well, how can someone get in touch with you if, if they need your legal services? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the only one I can actually answer. No, just kidding. Oh, no, no, you've been great. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't have a website or any digital signage anymore. Um, I get 99% of my clients through word of mouth. So really phone or email is the best way to reach me. My phone number is 440-237-9900. My email is jlaw, J-L-A-W, at jkr-law.com. And so those are probably the two best ways to reach me. I give a new clients a free half-hour consultation or a half-hour credit for a consultation if they hire me. It depends on the type of matter. Sometimes it's not something that is conducive to a free consult. But um, you know, I try to be try to work with people as best I can. Well, well, that's wonderful, and and the fact that most of your work is referral work these days that says a lot about the excellent work that you perform. Thank you. I like to think so. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks again for joining me on the show today. My best to you and your family, and we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks, Jamie. I wanted to thank Jacqueline Roberts again for coming on the show and providing some excellent information for us. Remember some of the key takeaways from our conversation. Keep our records organized and make sure that they're easily accessible for our fiduciary. Jacqueline also recommends keeping these important documents in a fireproof box if possible. Consider forming a trust as an alternative to probate. And I love the point that Jacqueline made that if we have something of value that we want to give to somebody, why wait until we're gone? Give it to them now and enjoy that shared happiness. As I mentioned in my interview, sometimes a real estate appraisal is needed in the probate process. If you're in Northeast Ohio, give me a call. I regularly perform real estate appraisals for probate. You can find me at the clevelandappraisalblog.com or aspenappraisalservices.net. If you're not in Northeast Ohio, go to findmyappraiser.com where you can search for a real estate appraiser in your area. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your taking the time to be here. Please stay tuned as I have more episodes in the works. If you have a topic that you'd like me to cover in this podcast, please email me at homevaluestories at gmail.com or you can find me on Twitter on my Twitter handle at stories value. I hope that all of your stories are happy ones. And now I leave you with a couple of dad jokes. Why do cows wear bells? Because their horns don't work. Did you know that the first French fries were not cooked in France? They were cooked in Greece. That's all I've got for this week, friends. I'll look forward to getting together with you soon. <laughs>